Hello, everyone. I'm Greg Goins from the Reimagined Schools podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual host. Make sure you check out all the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com and get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. Coming up on episode number 129 of the House of EdTech podcast, we're going to talk about transforming education for the better. We're going to make presentations and take screen sharing to the next level. We've got the House of EdTech VIP. And thanks to a great listener, we're going to talk about Flipgrid as an assessment tool. Strike up the band. Welcome to the House of EdTech podcast. I am your host, Chris Nessie. The House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. I discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and schools, and I share tools and tips that you can hear today and use tomorrow. You're going to hear the stories of teachers, leaders, and creators just like you. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way you teach and how your students learn. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. How are you? Thanks for checking in on the House of EdTech podcast. I'm so glad that you make this podcast part of your anytime, anywhere professional development. I'm still Chris Nessie, and again, this is episode 129 of the podcast. If this is the first time you're listening, well, you are in for a treat. This should be a really good episode. Not that the previous 128 are not good episodes, but hey, I'm always learning something new, and I thank you for taking this ride with me. If you're a long-time listener, thanks for coming back. You know I appreciate you, because I tell you all the time that I appreciate you. So what's going on in this episode? I'm going to start with a little bit of feedback. So let's head over to the House of EdTech answering machine. You have new messages. Chris, John Piper, Denton, Texas. Hey, just listen to episode 127. What a great podcast. I uh, There's a, uh, in the Denton Independent School District, there is an advanced technology campus. It's dedicated to doing all types of things uh, in the school district, but they also focus on some technology creation, some uh, studio work, uh, media. And uh, I just shared your podcast with the uh, one of the directors up there, and I'm sure they'll find some value in it. I uh, love the uh, social study students doing a 10 minute live audio feed every morning, man. What a great opportunity for those students to get some on air experience and learn about technology and how their voice can share a message uh, to people all over the world. So, Hey, keep doing what you're doing. I'm a subscriber and I'm tuning in. Talk to you soon. Hey, thanks, John. Thanks for being a subscriber. Thanks for sending in some audio feedback. And just to share with you who's listening a little bit about John, I got to meet John at Podcast Movement in Philadelphia in the summer of 2018, and John is a podcaster, and he educates in a different way. He is a huge baseball fan, and he creates a podcast called Behind the Dish with John Piper, and if you're a baseball fan or you know somebody who's a baseball fan, you need to share John's podcast because he's got, as I'm recording this, 29 episodes. And when I first met John, he didn't have 29 episodes, but I met him. I love baseball. And I went back and I listened to the episodes he had released and I've been listening ever since. And John's a good guy. And I will include a link to his podcast behind the dish in the show notes for this episode out at chrisnessy.com slash one, two, nine. And thank you, John, for sharing the house of ed tech with your local school district. That's really cool. I really appreciate it. And shout out to any new listeners from that district. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech. Next up, got a little bit of feedback from friend of the podcast, Derek Crabtree. And take it away, Derek. Hey, Chris, this is Derek Crabtree from Top 10 Teaching. Love the show. Keep pumping out all the great material. 
I just wanted to take a second and share with you that I was recently honored as my school district's Technology Innovator of the Year. And this was a huge honor for me, and I felt very fortunate to receive it. However, I felt like I would be remiss if I didn't give credit where credit's due. So you and your show have been instrumental in my career as a teacher, and especially as a teacher who strives to be innovative. So not only have I learned a lot about ed tech through the show and how to use it and apply it in certain situations, but I've reached out to you on several occasions personally, and you've been kind enough to help me be an innovative teacher. So again, thank you for all you do. Keep up the great work and keep putting out great material out there so uh, teachers like me can use it to become more innovative. Thank you. Derek, congratulations on being honored and receiving that that award and recognition from your school district. While flattered that you would take the time to send feedback to thank me for playing a role, um, it, it, it's all you. And, and I'm, I'm glad that the podcast played a small role in helping you, you know, do what you do every day in your school, in your district with your students. That That's really awesome. And I, I actually had to stop and rewind and listen to your message twice because I was like, wait a second, he he can't really be thanking me. You know, I'm just a guy from New Jersey talking about something he loves, and that's education technology. And if you didn't catch it, Derek is also a podcaster. He is the host of the awesome Top 10 Teaching Podcast, and 10 is T-E-N-N because Derek is from Tennessee, and his podcast spotlights passionate educators from Tennessee, the United States, and across the world. You could find more about Derek at Top10Teaching.com. And if you're not subscribed to his podcast, definitely go and check it out. And I'm sure very quickly he will earn your subscription and you'll also be learning about education technology from Mr. Derek Crabtree. Congratulations again, my friend. Next up, a little announcement, nothing to do with my show, but friend of the podcast. Also, Casey Bell, uh, you know her shake up learning. You probably also if you listen to this, you're probably also listening to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, which I produce. And Casey is launching her own podcast, which is awesome. Casey, congratulations. It is not out yet for those who are listening, but I want to take some time here on the House of Ed Tech to pump up and promote and build up the interest because the Shake Up Learning show is coming soon. So if you head over to shakeuplearning.com, Casey has some resources where you can get notifications about when that show is going to be dropping and you definitely want to get on board the Shake Up Learning show train. So be on the lookout for that. Check your podcatcher of choice. If you're listening to this well after it's come out, definitely make sure you're checking out and listening to the Shake Up Learning Show. Also available now, you want to check out a brand new EdTech podcast, and I have no problems promoting because we're not competing against each other, uh, any of the EdTech podcasts that are out there. Uh, definitely, you want to check out Monica Burns new podcast called the easy ed tech podcast. Monica was my guest on episode 95 of the house of ed tech, where we talked about ed tech and formative assessment. You could find that at Chris slash 95. And in that episode, I had pestered Monica about when she might be starting an ed tech podcast based on the great content that she writes about over at class tech tips.com. So she's got a brand new podcast that launched recently. So you definitely want to go into Apple iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcast and you want to search for and subscribe to the Easy Ed Tech Podcast with Monica Burns. As I record this, she's got a couple episodes out for you and they're short, they're quick. And if you're a fan of or follower of Monica Burns, you're definitely going to enjoy this podcast. I am already enjoying it and I just wanted to take some time to shout her out here as well. And a link will be in the show notes at chrisnessy.com slash 129 to her podcast too. And the last announcement here at the top of the show, it is March as I record and release this episode. And March means March madness. Now, for many of you, that could be the NCAA tournament, or maybe you just go crazy in the month of March and you feel a little bit mad in the head. Uh, But over the run of this podcast in March, I have done something I call the House of EdTech Final Four. And last year, 
I ran it as an actual tournament where I had people like you potentially voting from week to week throughout the month of March in an NCAA tournament style bracket of EdTech tools. Now, this year, unfortunately, I, I really just don't have the time to create the bracket and really do everything that I did last year. Um, so I'm going to be returning to the previous format, and you can look forward to an awesome episode 131, which will come out on March 31st, 2019, where I will talk about four specific ed tech tools, what they do, and I will package that episode in a nice, neat March Madness wrapping paper. I will include a link to each of the previous installments that I've done for the House of Ed Tech Final Four in the show notes once again for this episode out at chrisnessy.com slash one, two, nine. For this episode's EdTech Thought, I bring to you the following question. Will technology transform education for the better? Now, I recently read an article over at PovertyActionLab.org, and I'm going to share with you some excerpts from a piece I read, and this publication summarizes a soon-to-be-released academic review paper on education technology, and the title of the paper is Upgrading Education with Technology, Insights from Experimental Research. Now, this comes to us from j and j stands for the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, and they are a global research center working to reduce poverty by ensuring that policy is informed by scientific evidence. And it is anchored by a network of 171 affiliated professors and universities around the world. j conducts randomized impact evaluations to answer critical questions in the fight against poverty. And as I typically do, I'm always constantly searching the World Wide Web for interesting articles and topics related to education technology, and this one stood out. So I'm going to share some excerpts from this summary, and then there'll be a link to the full report in the show notes for this episode. And then at some point in the future, I will link to the complete paper, again, Upgrading Education with Technology, Insights from Experimental Research. So as I share this, I'm also going to be interjecting my thoughts, and I'll let you know when that happens. So to start, an excerpt from this summary, quote, in recent years, there has been widespread excitement around the transformative potential of technology in education. In the United States alone, spending on technology in education has exceeded $13 billion. That's right, billion with a B. Programs and policies to promote the use of education technology or ed tech, including hardware distribution, educational software, text message campaigns, online courses, and more, may expand access to quality education, support students' learning in innovative ways, and help families navigate complex school systems. However, the rapid development of education technology in the U.S. is occurring in a context of deep and persistent inequality. Depending on how programs are designed, how they are used, and who can access them, education technologies could alleviate or aggravate existing disparities. Now, here's where I'm going to jump in and say, absolutely. You know, in New Jersey alone, my home state, I've worked in affluent school districts and I have and currently work in, I don't want to say an impoverished district, but I work with a population now that is urban and transient and there are all different levels of socioeconomic disparity amongst the students I work with. And certainly, as much as we try to balance the technological scales, we, right now, we can't. I am still at a point where I have Chromebooks in my classroom, which is great. I've got 30, and my students have access to technology in class, but I have to very intentionally and carefully design what I ask and have my students do outside of class because they all don't have laptops or desktop computers or a way to get to the public library or the ability to stay after school. So I have to be very intentional, and this is something that I do see on a daily basis. Back to the excerpt, quote, while access to computers and internet is expanding, approximately 5 million school-age children still do not have broadband internet connection at home, putting them at a disadvantage for homework assignments, access to online resources, and digital literacy development. 
low-income students and students of color in particular disproportionately lack access to technology. Again, what I just said is absolutely true based on my own experience currently with the students I work with and the district that I work in. Back to the excerpt, quote, it is important to step back and understand how technology can help or in some cases hinder student learning. In this executive summary, we synthesize the experimental literature on technology-based education interventions, focusing on literature from developed countries. We share key results and highlight areas for future inquiry. Here are the four areas that I pull out as summaries, and these are highlighted within this reading. Number one, supplying computers and internet alone generally do not improve students' academic outcomes, but do increase computer usage and improve computer proficiency. Absolutely true. I see it every day. My kids have Chromebooks. We have access to computers throughout the building. But I'm, I don't see an increase in academics. I see an increased use of technology. And that's where, again, I, I, I walk this fine line of how do I balance technology use with what they get academically and how can I better harness the use of technology to increase what they're capable of doing academically. So it, it's, I, I don't have the answer, but certainly it's something that we need to think about. Number two, educational software or computer assisted learning programs designed to help students develop particular skills have shown enormous promise in improving learning outcomes, particularly in math. Now, I can't myself speak to math, but in social studies, where I focus on communication, collaboration, creation, and critical thinking, I'm leveraging technology to help my students do those four things. And then if I break it down even further, I'm helping them become better readers, writers, and thinkers. And I do see growth in those areas, particularly in social studies with something like doing document-based questioning, where this year I'm now experimenting a little bit by having my students do a DBQ assignment with the conclusion of every unit that we cover, which amounts to one DBQ per month. Now, I didn't do this when I had Luke, the student teacher with me in the fall semester, but my students did a DBQ during the fall semester. And now they have done one in January, February, and we're going to gear up to do one in March, April, and probably the end of May. So when all is said and done, my students will have done a lot of analysis, a lot of critical thinking, and a lot of writing with the hopes that as they move forward in their career, going from freshmen to sophomores, that they are better readers, writers, and thinkers. Number three, technology-based nudges, such as text message reminders, can have meaningful if modest impacts on a variety of education-related outcomes, often at extremely low costs. Thank you to things like Remind, which allow me to send text messages without kids knowing my phone number, and I don't need to know their phone numbers. I've talked about this many times on the podcast before. This is a great easy way to eliminate excuses and to keep your students accountable for what's going on. Once I implemented Remind this school year, I saw a difference. I saw more students responding with work that they were completing, and I saw the number of excuses and reasons for not having completed something go down because once they leave the classroom, I don't have any control over them. Not that I'm looking for control, but I want them to be aware of what they're responsible for. And certainly sending messages has allowed me to do that, as well as having them download and use when they can, the Google Classroom app, which they get notifications through, which is certainly very helpful. And number four, online courses are developing a growing presence in education, but the limited experimental evidence suggests that online courses lower academic achievement compared to in-person courses. However, students perform similarly in courses with both in-person and online components compared to traditional face-to-face -face classes. In MOOCs, or Massive Open Online Courses, behavioral interventions, like the mindset interventions described in Section 3, increased course persistence and completion rates. Now, I can't speak to this at the high school level, but what I do see at Rutgers, where I am an adjunct professor and teach hybrid courses, 
certainly I'm, I'm thankful that I teach hybrid courses and that means we meet once a week for 80 minutes and then the students have responsibilities and assignments to complete when they are outside the classroom via the learning management system canvas. So I, I certainly see and value face-to-face classes and in talking to my students, they hate taking all online classes and almost to, to the letter or whatever the phrase might be. When I find out that students who are taking completely online courses, they hate them. They, I mean, they fit their schedule. They certainly take them for some of the convenience that a completely online course offers, but they all value face-to-face interaction with their classmates as well as their professors. So I think that speaks for itself. Now, the conclusions that this draws include the following, quote, simply providing students with access to computer technology yielded largely mixed results. And this is based on like 126 different ed tech studies. Number two, conclusion, computer assisted learning shows considerable promise. And how could it not with artificial intelligence and different technologies that students are able to use to guide them and assist them in their learning? How can we not see growth in learning? Number three, evaluations of technology enabled behavioral interventions also generally find positive effects across all stages of schooling, although the impacts are generally small. You almost have to take that at face value. Number four, while technology-enabled social psychology interventions can have significant effects, impacts are generally small and specific to certain groups of students. And to me, I, I took that to mean when we're talking at talking about different demographics and the different places in the United States and I guess even worldwide, uh, I mean, there are just so many different factors that can impact a student's educational experience. And the last uh, conclusion that they draw is, though online learning courses have exploded in popularity over the last decade, this is me, mostly due to convenience, uh, back to the quote, we found that relative to courses with some degree of face-to-face teaching, students taking online only courses may experience negative learning outcomes. And I told you what I see at Rutgers, and I imagine that that doesn't change anywhere else you go, whether it's high school or college, how students feel about online learning. So I would love to know your thoughts on this. Again, I'm going to include a link to this multi-page PDF document in the show notes out of chrisnessy.com slash 129. And again, this asks the question, will technology transform education for the better? And this is a summary of an upcoming paper that will be titled Upgrading Education with Technology, Insights from Experimental Research. And again, the source on this comes from povertyactionlab.org. And that's my EdTech thought. My recommendation for this episode is new to me. I discovered it within the last couple of weeks, and I can't stop talking about it. And this is the first episode of the podcast that I get to talk about it here. And that is Google Cast for Education. So here are the highlights from the Chrome Web Store. With Google Cast for Education, you can share your computer screen from one Chrome browser to another. Cast for Education allows you to turn your computer into a wireless projector for screen sharing from another device. Just install the extension, give your device a name, and invite your students to cast. Teachers, you can download this extension and set up your device for wireless screen sharing. If you are unable to download the extension, you're going to want to contact your school administrator. Students, you can simply cast to your teacher's screen name from your Chrome browser you don't need an extension. For details, you can go to support.google.com slash edu slash cast for edu, and I'll include that link in the show notes at chrisnessy.com slash 129. This is awesome. Google Cast for Education is a, you need G Suite for Education in your district to use this. It's not available for regular Google users, but it is awesome. I have a computer in my room. I have my teacher desktop machine that I have a monitor, and I also have it hooked up to a projector. So I use it as almost like having two monitors. 
where I extend my Windows desktop so I can have stuff on the monitor, and I can also drag Windows over onto what's being projected. The Cache for Education is a little green button that appears in Chrome, and it basically turns your desktop computer into a Chromecast receiver. That That's the best way that I can really describe it. So if you're familiar with the Google Chromecast, and maybe you have one at home, or maybe your TV is uh, Chromecast enabled and you are used to throwing YouTube videos or Netflix or HBO content or whatever the case may be up onto your TV at home, this gives you that same functionality in your classroom. So in olden days, you would have one projector and one computer hooked up to the projector. You've still got that, but now through this extension, you can now invite or allow anyone in the room to cast what's on their screen, whether it's a tab, a window, or their desktop, to the projector. And what's really sweet, and I I almost hit the floor when I figured this out, it also does sound. So if you have students share media, their sound will also come out through your classroom sound system. Or really, the computer that's connected to the projector, if that's connected to a class sound system, your students' video or media audio will also come through. So what are the awesome ways that you can use this? Well, in social studies, I can now not necessarily have students come up to the projected image to give a presentation. They could certainly present from their seats and have full control without having to bring kids up and pull up one at a time their presentations or log in and out. So so that's all gone. Next, And this is something where I was able to really blow some people away in my school's math department. A lot of the math teachers in my school have touchscreen Chromebooks. So how can we sort of mash this together? Well, if you do this with the Google Cast for Education with a classroom full of touchscreen Chromebooks or really any touchscreen device that you can have access to Chrome in this manner, you now have turned every device into a smart board. So if you have access to a web-based whiteboard site, and I'll include links to a couple in the show notes, you can now give your students the opportunity from, from their seats, you know, say in a math class, share a problem or work out a problem, and you don't have to bring kids up to the front of the room or to your dry erase board, or let's say you only have one smart board in your room. And I, I've yet to see uh, a classroom that has multiple smart boards. But if you've got a smart board in your room, you can have kids cast to that computer, set it up on your smart board, and now every kid using their touchscreen Chromebook can, in essence, have access to a smart board-like feature right from their desk, and it's it's just super cool. So you definitely want to go check out the show notes, chrisnessy.com slash 129, and check out the Google Cast for Education plugin. Now, if you're using it, I've given you a couple of use cases about not having kids have to come up to present or how you would use it in a math classroom. But if you're already using it, I would love to hear your thoughts. So head over to chrisnessy.com slash feedback and let me know so I can then share your thoughts on a future episode of the podcast. And now for the featured content for this episode, we are going to talk about Flipgrid as an assessment tool. And the reason I decided to devote the featured area of this is because I recently got this question on the House of EdTech Flipgrid. So I'm going to turn it over to Kate, who is going to share her question, and then I am going to share my thoughts. And we're going to help Kate, and we're going to help you if you've been maybe struggling or you're curious about how you can truly use Flipgrid for assessment. So take it away, Kate. Hello, Flipgrid people. Um, Hello, Chris. I've been listening to your podcast for a couple of months now, and I love it. Thank you. Um, I have a question just out there for anybody. Um, I am looking at using Flipgrid with my third graders. Um, I know that I do need to get parental permission, but here's my question. Um, If I'm going to use Flipgrid as like a formative assessment to assess what they know, What's, is there um, a disadvantage in that if they're all going to uh, record a 30 second video, then that is going to take me a lot longer than it would if I were to grade a stack of papers. So that's my first question is 
um, is the time commitment worth it? Or is there, is there a solution to that? My other question is, can I monitor what they say before they post, which then would be another time issue. Then do I, am I watching their videos once and then approving to post and then once as an assessment. So um, those are my two questions. Is it very time consuming to watch all of your students' videos if they're all going to film, if they're all going to record something? And then is there a way to monitor what they record before they record it? I don't know anything about Flipgrid, so I don't know how it's going to let me know. Hopefully I'll get some notifications if anybody responds to me. Thanks. Kate, number one, thank you for adding this question to the House of EdTech Flipgrid. So for anybody who's listening, if you've got a question and want to throw it out to the community and the potential is there that I take the question and feature it in an episode just like I'm about to do, you want to go out to chrisnessy.com slash Flipgrid and certainly contribute over there. And you could also share your thoughts with Kate in addition to what I am about to share about her Flipgrid for assessment questions. So, Kate, you're asking two questions, the first revolving around any time disadvantage for using Flipgrid for assessment versus simply having your students write their responses to a question or some sort of prompt. And the second question revolving around uh, moderating their responses and also factoring into how much time is going to take you versus having them write their responses. What I can speak to is I think Flipgrid is great for something like this. And I, what I tell students, and whether it's high school or even college, where I've eliminated you know, written discussion boards and threaded conversations through the learning management system, I use Flipgrid because, and I tell them this straight up, I only read at one speed. I can listen a lot faster. So in terms of time, Having students respond on Flipgrid and recording video, you can speed up the responses when you listen back to them. Now, it's not like speeding up a podcast in something like Overcast, which really just cuts out silences and things like that. Uh, you, your students will, I don't want to say they're going to directly sound like chipmunks, but they're, the audio might be a little distorted. So, I mean, as long as they're speaking clearly, you can speed it up and you can kind of consume the content of their responses a little quicker than reading. Now, if you happen to be a fast reader, then this might slow you down. But I think it's certainly worth trying and giving your kids the opportunity to try and express themselves in a different way, because you might have students who write effectively, but maybe they're better speakers and they're better presenters and their personality comes through when they speak versus when they write. So I guess the first thing I want to recommend is maybe consider not making it either or give your students the choice. Do they want to submit a written response to something or would they like to try this, which if you have some students that are just, you know, even as third graders feel that they're better writers and they're just going to write their response. Well, then you can certainly grade those and assess those and consume that response the same way you've always done it. And then you would cut down on how much time it takes to watch videos. If not all of your students do it. But I think it's certainly worth giving them the choice. Now, in terms of moderating the responses, absolutely. When you create your grid in Flipgrid and you create a prompt that you want students to respond to, you can certainly put on and turn on the moderating, moderating, you can certainly moderate their responses. Now, that's not going to take a lot of time because really moderating allows you to see it. But once you approve it, that would then allow other students to see what their peers are posting. So you wouldn't have to watch them twice, but if you watch it, you can grade it. And if it's good, you can approve it and then it's out there. So I don't think there's be, there would be a need for you to consume their videos twice just to check it to see if it's good. I mean, they're third graders. You should be able to view their response, grade it. And then decide in that instant, is this worth putting out and, and, and posting? And if you're going to grade it, then certainly, you know, then, then you could publish it. So you don't have to just worry about students posting anything they want. And then, oh, my goodness, 
somebody posted something inappropriate at, at, at any grade level. So you can definitely moderate your responses. Now, I don't know, Kate, if you're using Google Apps for Education, but Flipgrid does integrate very nicely with Google, and you have the ability to share your grids in Google Classroom. And this is a great asset for us as teachers because this makes it easier for us to get Flipgrid to our students where they don't have to type in URLs, but you can keep them in the Google Classroom environment. Uh, Also, using it for assessment, Flipgrid does promote whole brain approaches to assessment. So when it comes to assessing a student's ability, uh, the authenticity test is often called into question if the tool doesn't or does not support assessment. But as educators, we know that an assessment can also be skewed if a student can't articulate a response using the tool or traditionally using pencil and paper. Flipgrid allows the students that struggle with writing, it gives them a chance to express themselves orally, which is great because they can do it in multiple takes, they can jump cut, they can be creative, they have the opportunity to basically draft and revise and edit a response before they submit it to you. So they can post it once they feel they've gotten it right. Now, in terms of making it easy to grade, when you set up a grid, Flipgrid also offers a rubric and grading tools that you can customize. So within a topic or a discussion, you can create a rubric to score student responses. And this feature would satisfy two goals. Number one, it allows students to see exactly what you're looking for. And number two, it allows you to input scores while you're watching the student response. And you can also offer a video response back to your students, or you can also provide them with written feedback. So Kate, to summarize for you and anybody who is also asking this question of should they use Flipgrid for assessment and how would it look or is it easier or not and what's it all going to entail? I would certainly say try it. You, I mean, at this point in the year, you know, when I do stuff on Podcast PD with Stacey Linus and AJ Bianco, we've talked about before how this is really a great time to try something new. I would never recommend to you or anybody to try something new like Flipgrid for assessment in September when everything is brand new. Try it now. You've got a great rapport built up with your students, with their parents, and they, they trust you. You know more about your students now than you would, say, in September when you would maybe consider launching something like this. So I say give it a shot. You know, I talk about on this podcast all the time, you know, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. So just give it a try. Create an assignment, give your students the choice, and go go through the motions, see what it's like, and then report back to me. <laughs> let, maybe let's bring you on as a guest, and we'll we'll talk all about the experience, you know, face to face, video to video, something like that. Um, so I certainly challenge you, Kate, to do this. And you know, if you're somebody out there who's listening who's not Kate, <laughs> please don't feel like I'm only talking to one person. Although. I am just talking to you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> um, let, let, let's let's have this conversation. You know, what does it actually look like in a practical application to use Flipgrid for assessment? Have you been successful? Has it flopped? What has your student's response been to being assessed using Flipgrid? You know, do you give choice? Is it, you know, Flipgrid and nothing else? Or are you maybe in the same boat as Kate where you haven't yet decided to to take the plunge and use Flipgrid for assessment. So I would certainly love your thoughts. You can head over to chrisnessy.com slash Flipgrid, and you can respond to Kate. And if you're interested in being on the show, Kate, please let me know. Send an email to me, feedback at chrisnessy.com, and let's talk about this further, and let's share your story. Speaking of sharing, it is time to share this episode's House of EdTech VIP with you. Now, this is a very unique and special House of EdTech VIP because it's somebody who I've never met, but I've had a conversation with, and I'm going to be working with, and I'm not going to be doing that face-to-face. 
So let me introduce you to Sarah Matthews. Sarah Matthews is a middle-level science and history student at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania. Sarah is a student of Sam Fesich, who was my guest on episode 122 of the podcast, and that's chrisnessy.com slash 122, and I am going to be virtually mentoring Sarah during this spring semester, and this is as a direct result of talking to Sam about what she is doing with EdTech and setting up her virtual mentor program for novice educators and pre-service teachers. So this is really super exciting. And as I record this, just a couple of days ago, I got to have a Google Hangout with Sarah one-on-one where we talked about her goals, her aspirations, why she wants to teach and why she wants to be an educator. And she is a sweetheart. And I want to encourage you to help get her more connected and show her all the great aspects of education. She is on Twitter and she is at Miss Matthews SR and that's M I S S M A T T H E W S S R. There'll be a link in the show notes and I'm looking forward to having, and now she's going to hear about this for the first time. I'm looking forward to having Sarah on at some point before the end of the semester to talk about ed tech education and get her perspective as a pre-service teacher at the very beginning of her educational journey, which I certainly believe will bring a lot of value to myself and also to you at whatever stage of the career you are currently at. So congratulations, Sarah. You are a House of Ed Tech VIP. Thanks again for checking out the House of Ed Tech podcast. I'm glad you, again, make this podcast part of your anytime, anywhere professional development. Let's keep the conversation going about the things that I discussed in this episode, from the future of education technology to using Flipgrid for assessment. Sky's the limit. We could talk about anything you want. Go over to chrisnessy.com slash 129. And if you have more generic feedback, you can go to chrisnessy.com slash feedback. Now, if you enjoy the podcast and hey, you get this far in the episode, you must enjoy it, or you're doing something where you can't hit the jump ahead to the next podcast button. But here you go. Do me a favor. Tell somebody else about the House of Ed Tech podcast. If you share it on social media, use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. If you've got questions that you'd like me to address here on the podcast, throw them up there using hashtag House of Ed Tech. You could do that on Twitter. You could do that on Instagram. And hey, while you're at it, if you're on Instagram, follow the podcast on Instagram at House of Ed Tech. You can also become an awesome supporter of the show. My awesome supporter program is powered by Patreon.com, and Patreon allows a creator like me to have somebody like you support what I create. So I want to thank my awesome supporters right now. Thank you to Anthony Arnault of the New Teacher Podcast over at NewTeacher.org. Thank you to Eric Kurtz from ControlAltAchieve.com. Dan Gallagher from gallagertech.edublogs.org. Carlos Garza, Mr. G, from the Aced Tech Podcast. Find that over at aced.tech. Thank you to Peggy George from Classroom 2.0 Live. And Jen Giffen from the Shooks and Gif, the podcast, over at bit.ly slash shooks and gif. Jeff Herb from instructionaltechtalk.com. Mike Messner at teachermike72 on Twitter. My buddy, J.P. Presavento from the Bits and Bites of Education podcast. You can find him and the podcast over at jpprez.com, and that's with two Zs. Thank you to Lynn Smarges, at Lynn Smarges on Twitter. Scott Titmus at SD Titmus on Twitter. And thank you to Kyle Wilcox. He is at Level Up Ed Tech on Twitter. Thank you, everybody, for all your support. If you're interested in supporting the podcast, go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome. The next episode of the podcast will be episode 130, and that's going to come out on March 17th, 2019. I look forward to seeing you then. Until next time, thank you for learning with me. And remember, using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try. And what? Who's this special guest in the studio before the end of the episode, say hello, Miles. Hello. Say goodbye, Miles. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody.
All right, here's a little bonus conversation between me and the boy. How you doing, son? Good. It's been a while since you've been on the podcast. Why are you good? Vacuum today. Because <laughs> he vacuumed today. Do you want to be on the podcast again in the future? Yes. I think I'll make that happen. I'll talk to the producer and the host. Oh, wait. That's me. <laughs> and you're the, also the hey, producer. Hey, c- can I put something important out on the internet? Ready? Here you go. I love you, Miles. You, t- I do too. You love yourself, or do you love me? You. Oh, you be smooch. I love you. Oh, that's right. The next episode will be coming out on St. Patrick's Day, and at that point, Miles will have had his birthday. So, if you want to send out birthday wishes to my son, you could do hashtag Happy Birthday Miles, which I'll be checking on Twitter. See you next time, everybody.